to do something that incorporates the kind of knowledge that I've gathered through the years with regards to boutiques, the people that run them, the people that make the clothes, blah blah blah, with the kind of clothing I collect myself. So the name came and when the name came the rest, it's like if you're a writer sometimes the title of a song comes and then the rest just flows. So, so this is how we've got to King Carnaby, the 60s dandy of me. So. Like any good student, I've got notes, so I'll be referring to my notes. I must say that there's a lot, but it's all that I've written, nothing that I've copied out from text that's on the internet. There's one paragraph that I've um, taken from, it's a historical note about what a dandy is, and that's the only bit of text that I've copied, and the rest is just purely mine. So. If there's any grammatical, you know, <laughs> mistakes, you know. It's so, alright, so we'll, uh, hey, we'll get the... Yeah. yeah, I bought this actually, but... Madonna. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, mean, uh, <laughs> I, I might be alright, actually. <clears throat> You've got your reading glasses. <laughs> <laughs> I actually did say that, so bear with me as well when I'm reading, because I actually, yeah, I am 50, so I do. No. No. Started then, so King Carnaby, the 60s dandy, and me. Tonight, I aim to take you all on a journey, and along the way, we'll have a stroll down King's Road and Carnaby Street. Hopefully, we can look around the shops and the boutiques that seem to appear like an explosion of colour and fabric in a period of time between 1965 to 1968, which is now better known as the Peacock Revolution. Oops. My name is Peter Feely. <laughs> <laughs> I've been obsessed with the 60s clothing for over three quarters of my life, so do the maths in 50. <laughs> I hope to enhance tonight's show with garments from my personal collection, and hopefully this will help with the experience when I'm talking about the boutiques and shops. So, this is the bit of text that I've uh, copied out, and it is kind of, what is a dandy? Dandy is a name for a man who pays great attention to dress and fashion, and often dresses with a flamboyant style. <laughs> the term was used, first used in the late 18th century, but became better defined in the early 19th century. At first, dandy referred to a group of trend-setting young aristocrats in England. Other names for dandies included bows, mashers, macaronis, fops, and exquisites. Although first used to refer to a flamboyant dresser, by the 19th century, a dandy man was a man who dressed with careful stylishness. In the 21st century, the term dandy is still used to refer to either a fastidious or a flamboyant dresser. As the <laughs> <laughs> so this brings us to the 60s dandy man. The 60s dandy man liked to, liked to wear velvets, devore shirts, brocade and regency jackets, paisley, satins, silks, <coughs> ruffles, polka dots, Crushed velvet loons, Indian cottons, fedora hats, costume jewellery, tapestry prints, embroidery, glasses, feather boas, walking sticks, monocles, scarves in chiffon, bes bespoke or tailor-made was essential, furs, Italian leather and mohair. So here's some fine examples of uh, people I'm sure we're all familiar with. The quote! <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. 
Footage, I'm sure most of you have seen before, but it'll get us all in the mood for the proceedings. Fantastic. So glad that someone, Pathé, managed to film this kind of magic because otherwise we'd have just left with people like me talking about it. That's not good. Right, so um, we're going to start with King's Road. So, King's Road is located in the west end of London. The long road cuts through both Chelsea and Fulham, starting at Sloan Square and ending at Edith Road. And some of you might know what Edith Grove was famous for. Yeah. It was a, a road where the, the fledgling R&B band, when they got together, lived. But that's another, another story. <laughs> Always a preferred residence for the privileged, the rich and the famous. The Chelsea set became a moniker for the exclusive few movers and shakers in the mid to late 60s who lived in and around King's Road. So this takes us to our first boutique. Hung on you. Hung On You opened its doors in the winter of 1965, spending its first couple of years at 22 Kale Street and then moving to its final residence of 430 Kings Road. Michael Rainey, the son of an English politician, was married to Jane Ormsby Gore, herself the daughter of a well-known, at the time, politician. Michael had no formal training or education within the fashion world. Being young, with time and money, I'd imagine he just fell into the industry through association. Michael definitely had a keen eye, and once he had his mind set on opening the boutique, ambition and spirit would all help. Bolstered by friends with money and contacts, Hung On You was born. The shop front was painted in a very eye-catching yellow with, name, with the name em emblazoned over the front in a groovy font. An interesting fact that I recently found out was that the commission to do this paintwork was given to both Nigel Weymouth and Michael English, also named, uh, known as Hapsash and the Coloured Coat. Mm -hmm. yeah. So that's quite interesting because then they went on to their own boutique and do the shop painting there, which we'll talk about <laughs> soon. Of all the customers who purchased at Hung On You, the Beatles were definitely the most famous. Brian Epstein would commission all the Beatles stage gear for their final world tour in 1966. Individually, the Beatles, the Stones and many more would choose to wear Hung On You clothing. Michael was using local tailors to make his wonderful designs. One of these was a father and son called Foster and Son. The son, Cliff, Frost, Cliff Foster, would eventually team up with Tara Brown. Tara himself being the then famous socialite and was heir to the Guinness fortune. Together they would forge a famous clothing company called Foster and Tara and at their height they were making clothing for Granny Taser Trip, Dandy Fashions as well as Hung On You. John Crittle would enter the frame for a short spell at Hung On You. He became a designer for Michael before setting his sights on his own boutique. The move from 22 Cale Street to 430 Kings Road would prove to be a total disaster. The higher rent added to that, the regular customers just didn't like the new location. The business then started to nosedive, as did Michael and Jane's interest in the fickle world of fashion. And by the summer of 68, like a lot of people, they found God and moved to Asia. <laughs> so here's some um, examples of 
this was a classic shadow stripe velvet jacket, which was worn by many different pop stars of the day. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to turn on. What I'm going to do is, when when I show some garments, I'm just going to turn on the lights. Can we, we did a dry run with some friends the other night, and when it's dark, you can't see anything. So even though the lighting, what brilliant, fantastic. <laughs> Okay, so like a lot of you know, like men and women, like finding this clothing in the 21st century is extremely hard. And uh, even if you're a millionaire, even if you've got a lot of money, so these things just don't come up. So you know, when you get them, it's quite an amazing and lucky thing. So this shirt was one that I did own, it was from Hong Kong New. It's like a ruffled shirt which I've um, now sold on. So this takes us on to a very special garment. This is Michael Rainey, that was the manager, very dapper, handsome looking man. So <laughs> The tie itself was was actually made by Chris Jacker, who was Mick's younger brother. Chris went to art college, and when he came out, he wanted to make his own way. Obviously, having a bigger brother, so he had the idea of using his art and painting on garments. So these ties were his first his first um, proto footstep into the fashion world. And so here's some good examples of his his gear. Like Chris yeah. made things for John Lennon. Mick Jagger, Jimi Hendrix, amongst others. No, it, it, it's, it's actually, it's actually, it's felt in. It's very primitive. You can actually see the pencil underneath. Bento, you can do that. You can see where the pencil is. It's a bit like one of Berto's Actually, it, it was done by Berto. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, it's, it's like a, a like a, I'd say it's a, a felt tip pen on a on a silk background. So how I got this tie? A few years ago, I was doing an article on dandy fashions, and the manager of the shop in the sixties was Alan Holston. So we, through through talking to him via the phone, we eventually got to the point where he invited me and Susie down to his house a few times. So a couple of years anymore, by the way. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> have you gone back? <laughs> have you gone past the? Uh, yeah, yeah, that was him back then, handsome man. So anyway, uh, a couple of few years ago, on my birthday, I received a package. So I opened it up, and, and this tie fell out. And being the anorak I am, I knew straight away what it was, and it was kind of like, oh my god. And along with the. Uh, even look at it makes me a bit emotional so. still. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you cried. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, wow. So yeah, so it's quite a, a treasured, yeah. a treasured garment. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. like, well, we all know, like, if you wanted to sell that on the internet, something like that, you wouldn't. Yeah, exactly. Be the light skin. If you ever skin one, though. so um, <laughs> now we're with Alan. That'll that'll uh, conveniently take us on to dandy fashions. Okay, do you like how I did that? Send me. Send me. Can I ask you a question? Is there just we can open an extra window in this? <laughs> there isn't. They don't open. They don't open. They're frightened that people will see. Like you can't open the window. In the UK, there's this thing called health no, no, and safety. No, no, no. In Italy, you go down. No, no, it's not the same. They're frightened that we'll jump right in the window. It's not the same. It's not the same. It's not the same. It's 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 the same. Sure. <laughs> 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 
Dandy Fashions was the brainchild of John Grisham. During his short tenure at Huan Yu, he managed to befriend some rich and influential figures who would buy into his new project. John himself moved to London from his native Australia in 1964, and it didn't take him long to settle in London. And by all accounts, John was a charismatic and very talented tailor and designer. He opened his first boutique in a tiny two-roomed building at 56 Queensgate Mews, and he, and he then found a young lad who would become Alan Holston, who would manage the shop at the age of 18. He actually met him at the speakeasy, and just like the look of him, went over and started speaking. And the shop front was painted by Binder Edwards and Vaughan. The team who were also famous at the time, and they, they, they did the mural on the front of Lord John, as well as the Beatles, Paul McCartney's piano. They were kind of the commission, they were the, the, the cool people to, to, if you wanted, paintwork doing. They were, the abbreviation BEV was what they were better known as. So, Tara Brown, who was a financial backer, plus his newly formed company, Foster and Tara, were the main tailors for dandy fashions. Tara Brown was sadly killed in a car crash whilst on his way to the finished building to have a look. And this incident is, was famously immortalised in the Beatles song, A Day in a Life. So, the, so people think it, wasn't, it was other things, but it was actually John wrote about when Tara Brown the, blew his mind out and it was Tara Brown's car crash. He didn't notice that the lights had changed. Correct. <laughs> like Hung on You, Dandy Fashions was the place for the rich and famous to purchase their gear. From Brian Jones to Jimi Hendrix, they were all disciples of Dandy Fashions. A young designer called Freddie Hornick would enter the frame sometime in early 1967. He would work alongside Alan, plus adding his tailoring and design talents to the table. By the May of 1968, due to John Cri Crittle's connections with the Beatles, Dandy Fashions would become the second clothing outlet that would belong to the fledgling Apple industry. Dandy Fashions would now be called Apple Tailoring, and, a and within a year of the takeover, Apple Tailoring would be bought out, and eventually the booty would become a denim shop, which is quite sad, and then eventually it closed in the end of 1969. So here's some great examples of Dandy Fashions. I don't know if any of you you know Andy Bone from The Herd? Yeah. Like, yeah. And Stages Club. Yeah, yeah. In, in later years. Well, he was, he was one of Dandy Fashion's first and loyal customers right through, you know, the tenor of its time. And one question I did ask Alan, because he met everyone, I said, out of all the 60s people you met, who was the coolest? Who do you reckon? He said, Hendrix. 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 You're right. George Hendrix. Hendrix. Yeah. But, but, it, there's some great stories, but... Like um, like a lot of this stuff, like I could talk about one of these shops for hours, so I'll save them for other. But some great stories about Jimi Hendrix having parties in dandy fashion. And, uh, oh, no, do it. So there's the man. So this, this is a quite interesting one. This is the, when 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 someone would come in to order a garment, Alan would take all their vital statistics and write them down. And this particular customer was Paul McCartney. It was, a, it was a narrow kind of jacket in, in gold jacket. Yes. Change the schedule. I wonder if we might just want an intermission for five or ten minutes. What we'll do is we'll get we'll get through the King's Road. Yeah. We'll get through the King's Road, and when we go to Carnaby Street, we'll have we'll have ten minutes to have and then come back in now. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
The famous picture that a lot of people have seen of George Harrison in his William Morris green yeah. jacket, yeah. that was on that day, the 22nd of May, the grand opening. Mm -hmm. They all went to this, I can't re remember the name of the Italian restaurant across the road and all had a party after the opening. So, so that, this takes me on to the, can we have the light on again please? Like, uh, I, like uh, I own one garment by Dandy Fashions and uh, these, tr these velvet trousers. Ooh. And then. Uh, you try them on. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. You want to leave me? So, the story behind these, believe it or not, and this happens a few times. My good wife found them. We were in Margate, and these were in a vintage shop in Margate. And Susie found them. So, uh, they, 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 A lot of yeah. 60s clothing, it's made to last, and, and they're so like there was a few holes that I've had, and they're actually a bit big for me. Take them in. <laughs> so that's not the problem, I'm bigger than you. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. I'm a size 38, good idea. Berto's already took a sorry. He wants his tie back as well. Uh, right, so uh, we're going to head further up Kings Road to Granny Takes a Trip. Uh, Granny Takes a Trip opened its doors at 438 Kings Road in the spring of 1966. Nigel Weymouth and his then girlfriend Sheila Cohen had the idea of opening the boutique as a vehicle to sell Sheila's massive collection of old Victorian women's clothes. The wacky name was most probably inspired whilst I was under the influence, but you know that's a, not no. official. Well, no. 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 the ever changing decor on the shop front soon propelled Granny Taser Trip to become the premier boutique in all of London. <laughs> it is also important to point out that the boutique had a very secret weapon in the name of John Pierce. Savile trained and with a total disregard <coughs> for tradition, he set about turning the men's fashion world on its head. It was John who first started using Liberty Prince in his garments. The most famous of these being his use of William Morris upholstery fabrics in his jackets. The Beatles can be seen wearing Granny's Beagle collared shirts on the back of the Revolver album. It wouldn't be long before any pop star would be sold would be sporting gear from 488 Kings Road. Granny takes a trip. Clothing came with an extraordinary price tag, which left me and the mortals two options, either to window shop or away to the lottery windfall. By 68, the business was in free fall. John had almost given up, Nigel and Sheila had split up, and which was most probably accentuated by their collective lack of any business acumen. Because a lot of these people, they had these ideas, even the Beatles when they set up Apple Boutique, but they had no idea of the business side. And it's the same with bands, why bands get ripped off and still do to this day. A lot of people in arts. They, they, they create art, but when it comes to the money side, they're hopeless. So. You can't be an artist and a businessman. Pardon? You can't be an artist and a businessman. Exactly. Well, unless you're Jewish. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Tonight, I'm not mentioning that American president once. Thankfully, Nigel would be given a lifeline in the name of a former friend called Freddie, Freddie Hornick. This is the same Freddie who started out at Dandy Fashions. Fred would buy out and take over the dying legend. He would revive and revitalise the booty with his ideas, enthusiasms and creative talents, which he had in abundance. Freddie would soon awaken the sleeping giant. He would take Grand Taste a trip to America 
opening a further two boutiques in both New York and LA, and that's a, a different story. So that's Freddie there. So if we go back, when when um, when Nigel and John Pierce had, had the shot, when they designed, when they had the logo, the famous logo with the mushroom, the legend was that if you bought a garment with this on and you licked it, it sent you on a trip. But John, John Pierce, you know, I'm not trying to name John, but he actually told me himself it was bullshit. So, so um, you were at that, you were there as well, weren't you, Stephen? Yeah. So if we go on to the next, so, so from, from 1966, to before Freddie took over, all the garments were, were known as the grey label. So when Freddie took over, it then became the red label. They're, they're both extremely ex, you know, rare and expensive, but the real, real dealers, they want the grey stuff. Yeah. And diverting a bit, but a few, a few months ago, um, Keith West sold his famous smoking jacket, and it was on eBay for, it started at £2,500. So it, it started going down in price, and eventually I contacted, it was his wife, Patricia, that was selling it, I got in contact with her, and she was going to let me have it for 850 quid. But when I, but when I had close-up pictures of it, it was totally, totally wrecked, and, and I'm a working class lad, and yeah, I have spent stupid money on clothing, but just this one, I just let it, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, no, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I let that one go, but in a way I am kicking myself, because it would have been a lovely kind of piece to have for things like this. Oh. When was the so, position, When did, was the kind of point? Uh, 68, mid-68, yeah, that then Freddie took over and started to ease. He started his new label in about 69, and it went on, I think, the last, I think New York went on to about 77. So, uh, so okay, so this takes us on to, to, to my garments from Granite Tinsa Trip. I've been really lucky actually, in, in, I've, had, I've owned four jackets from Granite Tinsa Trip, but I only now own one, I've sold the others off. And I've owned a couple of pairs of trousers, but I only own one now, because as I've got older, I've, I'm starting to downsize. So I've got a collection of things that I want to keep, but, but a lot of the clothing I like to wear, I like to spend money on new designers, you know, and, and wear, you know, keep, you know, because there's some really talented people around. So if I'm have, if I'm buying clothes, I, I try and buy new stuff, but in you know, in the, in the same vein of the '60s. So a lot of the stuff I've sold, and there's a guy in here tonight that's. I'd quiet a lot of stuff off Cast me. Cast-offs. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, it ain't well, you know, it, it was cast-offs when Good. I did it. Good call. So, what would you guys say? This was um, a, a classic kind of three-button... That shade of blue is mad. That shade, that shade of blue is just incredible. Right, so there's a, quite an amazing story behind this. As I've been on as well. So um, this, I, I bought this jacket and I bought um, well, like Cyril Jordan from the Flaming Groovies. I bought a jacket off him from him as well. So it was a dealer, and he bought this. He bought this Cyril Jordans and another one. But this and another jacket that he bought actually belonged to Geezer Butler from Black Sabbath. Hey. So if you're a black well, well, fan, you're allowed yes. to actually kneel yes. down and kind of... <laughs> <laughs> so this is, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is from the... I've got a great Black Sabbath story I'm going to pass on to you as well. This is, this is when Freddie took it over. But, but the cut is still the classic 66. And I, there's a company called Beatles.com making clothing. I actually... Gave them this jacket so they could get the, you know, the, oh, I'm not I'm forgetting this. Like one of the idiosyncrasies with Granite Six Trip, they, had, they used to use fishtail cuffs in most of their jackets. So I gave this jacket to the guy, and then he copied it, and you know, the rest is history with that. So, um, so, the, so Black Sabbath, when they were um, making it big, when, when they used to, when they used to shop in. In Grand States of Trip, the, at the time there was two guys in there working, two Americans that Freddie took over, 
one was called Gene Krull and one was called Marty Bailey. And basically it was a drug it was a drug haven. So Black Sabbath were going in there to buy their drugs. And they used to go in there no, so often no. they actually used to call cocaine Krell. Gene Krell, <laughs> and that's that's actually documented, you know. Coke and velvet, beat to sir. Put it on, Pete. Put it on. I'm too sweaty. I'm, I'm too sweaty. Oh. Oh. Put it on later. Oh. Okay, sir. And nothing else. All right. And, uh, they, they, these are on the cusp of both. The actual label is the the, the early label. On on shirts and trousers, obviously they didn't have the big. You know, so they put a more dainty. So this was either, to me, they're very Americano. So I would say they're more yeah. Freddie Hornick. Yeah. But but obviously he had some labels left over from the '66 and put them in. But they're in mint condition. No. Look, the yoke on them is classic. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I'm not, I'm not putting them on either, so, you know. <laughs> so, uh, if you always buy a chocolate fit, you always... Yeah, yeah, that, that part of your own like, luckily enough, I suppose, because I've got that, in the 60s, the blokes were a lot really? thinner, so no, no I'm really lucky, most of the stuff that I, I get, I can... I can just get into it, so, <laughs> so that, that, that's down to my mum and dad. So, so, you know, so that, that takes us to the end of the King's Road. So we've been, we've all been shopping down King's Road. Oh, we flagged a, flag a taxi, and now we're on Carnaby Street. Yeah. Carnaby Street is situated in Soho, central London. Bill Green opened Vince Mann's shop at 5 Nuba Street in 1954, making Bill the first of a new wave of boutiques that would cater exclusively to the male demographic. Bill started his career as a photographer for a magazine that specialised in men's health. This took Bill to exotic locations and he got to see how the European man was dressing. All this was enough to inspire Bill to bring this continental style to a drab post-war London. Bill's boutique was the first boutique to incorporate such exotic fabrics as velvets and silks. His clothing was tighter fitting and somewhat more casual, bringing black denim jeans as well as Breton t-shirts from the south of France to the streets of London, the streets of 50s London. Word quickly spread about this cool shop, selling clothes as worn by the film stars of the day. Vince Mann's shop would soon be the talk of town and was definitely the catalyst for what was to follow. John Stephen moved to London from Glasgow in 1952. First working for Moss Brothers and then he worked in Bill shop. So you see that thing again where someone works in someone's shop yeah. And, yeah. and you know what's going to happen from him working for Bill, don't you? Or John, Stephen. So, uh, inspired by working for Bill and the burgeoning street styles becoming ever more popular due to the baby boomer generation, John opened his first boutique in 1959 and he named it His Clothes. This was located on 5 Carnaby Street and this catered specifically to the teenage market. John would set about revolutionising the whole of the men's fashion industry and the media would soon crown him the king of Carnaby Street. Carnaby Street itself would soon become world-renowned and a tourist destination, helped somewhat by such illustrious names as Lord John, Urban Sellers, Take Six, Gear, Paul's Boutique, West Wall, Pop Boutique, Donny's Clothing, I Was Lord Kitchener's Valet, Kleptomania, and all making their home for the next two decades in Carnaby Street. So, if we could turn the light on, I've got quite a few bits and bobs from Carnaby Street to show you. So, what I've done is I've kind of put it into the shops it's from. Like, um, tonight, obviously, there's certain things I've omitted. There'll be shops and boutiques that I've not mentioned, but for, for many reasons, some being I don't think the garments that I've got are that interesting enough to warrant speaking about them. And also, you know, there, there was... There was hundreds of boutiques in London if I was talking about them even concisely it'd take all night. Do that so, next year. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Special yeah. museum yeah. prices. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to start with Lord John. 
So this is a lovely example. <laughs> It's like a like a balloon sleeve with a gathered shoulder, and it fits nice. But I'm not going to put it on. So that, that was the the. Show us your hairy chest. <laughs> so so um, in the in the mid sixties, well, Lord John was owned by two brothers, John and Warren Gold. Started in '66, and obviously they, they they were famous for clothing for the small faces, the Beatles, the Stones. And Warren actually is still he's still got a shop in um, London Golders to this Green. day. Golders Green. Yeah, and it, and he's famously got a, a cape that John um, John Lennon had ordered but he never picked up. So it's kind of and actually Phil Phil Ashby. Is your case is exactly the same? Yeah, it is. Yeah, Phil Ashby's got one that's is identical to the one that John Lennon had ordered. Shame I didn't think about it, you'd bring it down to that. I was doing a bit too So then you'd be digging my thunder, so you know. And another time we'll guess we'll uh, collaborate. Next year. 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 So these are like say in beautiful condition like I've, I've got velvet trousers that I've had made in recent years and when you when you go on your knee they, they wear so to find 60s trousers Me and Phil have both got kippy ties, but I, can we, I didn't. I just, Mr. Fish tonight's King Carnaby, and the <laughs> throat I've brought. Mr. Fish was Mayfair, so. Next year. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Customer yeah. Adam, yeah. 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 Like uh, I've had, like um, I've had, I'm not showing off when I say these things. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I think I've got yeah. six or seven take six jackets. Yeah. And like my dandy fashion trousers, believe it or not, Susie actually found a, a, a take six jacket in Derby in an Oxford. <laughs> <laughs> So this is like a classic Regency jacket with the high collar. Wow. An amazing. Can you see it's like green with velvet, velvet green. Yeah. Very nice. Uh, the, and the real exaggerated um, fish, fish cuff, fish tail cuffs. <laughs> And, and matching trousers as well. Yeah. That was with the guys in Canary Wharf to shame. Obviously. <laughs> and like, uh, it's in oh, mint condition. That was yeah, Take Six was actually, when it started, like 20 guys that might have garments. When it, when it first started, in the 60s, on the label, it had Brett and Collins. And then in the 70s, it was just Take Six. Well, Brett and Collins were Sydney Brett and Jack Collins, and they started the business in '65 and eventually had 15 <laughs> shops in and around London. And uh, they sold off the business in 1970. And actually, Take Six carried on 
until 1977. Just so, so that's a beautiful example. I, I sold for the lovely I've got a purple one. The purple one, yeah. Same, same, exactly the same style, just different, different colour. So there's that. Do you wear that, Pete? Yes, yeah, 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 yeah. The last time I think I wore it was um, for a Leicester City kind of. Sorry, Trump and football. Sorry. Right, I I actually like I say I've I've been downsizing for a long time now, so I very rarely buy. Believe it or not, I just got this on Friday. So I thought I'd bring it, you know, so I'm going against everything. Beautiful, like, take six. It looks like it's never been more than this one. Yes, like, button down, flowery. Where was this from? A, a guy on Facebook. Um, ben, ben actually um, kind of got me onto it. You know? and, I, and I kind of thought, well, I'll have that. So, so we're now going to go over to... Urban Sellers. Urban Sellers was very much like Take Six, the same kind of concept. And he he decided to call his shops in the 60s mates by Urban Sellers. And in, I don't know if any of you know, like when he left the fashion industry, because he was a trained architect. And one of Urban Sellers' famous most famous buildings is the Shard in London. So it's the same guy that like a lot of these clothes, they're very similar from shop to shop. A lot of the, a lot of the clothing was made from the, made by the same tailors. We're just putting different labels in, all of copying each other. So. A lot of the um, a lot of the tailoring that was done on the Street was, was done by Jewish tailors because yeah. they were very famous at the time. They were very cheap. They were getting knocked off again. They were making them very cheap. <laughs> And uh, like Paul opened the business with his, it was um, Nancy and Susan Spiegel, and they opened it in '59. So it wasn't long after John Stephen, because obviously once these designers seen this idea, you know, it won't be long before they all wanted a piece of the action. So Paul's boutique went on till the late '60s as well. Paul's boutique were always known as they were kind of on Carnaby Street, because a lot of the Carnaby Street clothing was classed as the cheaper to the King's Road. But Paul's Boutique was always known as a boutique that was more high-end, you know, like the kind of the posh kind of, of the... So I've, I've been lucky enough to own quite a, quite a few garments by Paul, and a few of the salt as well. So this is one of my favourites. Like I say, you get the incredible back vents to the left, to the guys, lovely detail in, in mint condition, and it was made to fit. You know, it's one of those ones that was. Now, I'm not going to There's that. There's a. It's a tie that I'll pass along. Very much, most probably made by the same people that made Lord John's. Is that the one you wear on the telly? No, no, that's it. That, no, that was it. That was it. Lord Kitchen's valet one. Oh yeah, it's more. He wasn't that. 
But actually, the jacket I wore was the one I saw Tula Paul's being frocked Which one? Black one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, there, was a, there was a documentary on... It must have been very 1966. So all the, all the regional news programs had their own half hour. Oh, yeah. You can get them on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. They're really, and honestly, they were really worth watching. Like the North East, uh, the West Midlands. And uh, they, did one, they did one on the East Midlands. And they talked about... There was a, a lady that had a birdcage in, uh, in, in, in Nottingham. So they, yeah. A a shop. So that now we're gonna we're gonna hail a taxi over to Baker Street. Okay. So we now move further north to 94 Baker Street. And here is some lovely footage of the grand opening on the December 7th, 
to our European friends here tonight, they might not get the silly black thing. She was kind of a so Apple Boutique, there is no exact date understood of when Apple Boutique, the idea was conceived. But I would hazard a guess that the dream like boutique would have been would have entered the minds of the fabs whilst in their whilst in the creative throes of writing Sergeant Pepper. This would put a time frame of around spring of 1967. Work on the booty would commence in the October of 67. The beautiful psychedelic mural that would turn a tiny section of grey and drab post-war Baker Street into the most happening place on planet Earth was carried out by a Dutch art collective known as The Fall. As well as painting the mural, the four were also responsible for the design of the interior. It really must have been like walking into an Aladdin's cave. Once you step through the glass front doors with handles carved in wood in the shape of an outstretched human hand, once you're inside, your eyes and mind would have been instantly mesmerised by all the wonderful treasures held within the walls. The boutique was on two floors with sales assistants dressed in the best that Apple could offer, eager and willing to help assist in the customer's every need. With an array of exotic fabrics from all over the world in a multitude of colours, the whole experience must have been like floating in and around a rainbow. The clothing designs and styles could have only been created by one's imagination, and this would have been a mind that had travelled once back in time and who had visited King Arthur in Camelot, spent an afternoon in Sherwood Forest with Robin Hood, Maid Marion, and the Merry Men, and again, all the clothing designs were carried out by the fall. Unfortunately, the Beatles' foray into the world of fashion would be short-lived. Firstly, the powers that be disapproved of the psychedelic mural, the result being that 94 Baker Street had to have a new paint job, from being psychedelic rainbow, the exterior became a plain white. And I wonder, did this then mirror the, the Beatles' idea for when they had at the same time the White Album? Yeah. 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 And that's not out of the book. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Apple Booty was hemorrhaging money at an, at an alarming rate and it was decided that enough was enough. So on the 29th of July, 1968, which will be next week, so you know, yeah. <laughs> 50 years on. I was born by this time, by the way, so. No, you were. So I might be in this bit. <laughs> and not even a year old, Apple Beauty closed its doors for the last time, with a free for all for whoever was lucky enough to fight through the throng of people yeah. who were trying to grab a piece of the Beatles for free. So we've got a nice bit of footage of that oh, for final free for all. What can I say? Out of, uh, out of all the boutiques that I've ever dreamt of owning a piece, to Apple Boutique, like when I got into the Beatles and when I started knowing about getting into the clothing side, it was, it was always the, the place where I wanted to buy something like that. Most probably out of all the places to buy or to get hold of, it's most probably the rarest. So this garment here, I near this is this is like the fisherman, this is the one that yeah, was near, yeah. uh, <laughs> this was actually on eBay about seven years ago. And uh, the seller would have you know, I, I was buying it, it was all, all sorted and then for whatever reason the person decided to take it off eBay. Most probably someone said you could sell it on a private auction and get ten times the amount. Oh. And that 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 actually <laughs> <work, laughs> <laughs> where were they? Well, we're so, uh, yeah. Somewhere in America. <laughs> could have been, yeah, right. been Donald Trump. <laughs> 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 he doesn't have any taste. <laughs> <laughs> like, with, like Apple oh, garments, oh, oh, Apple boutique garments as well. They were only made in tiny numbers. The, uh, this was, there was only three of these made, and George Harrison had one of them, because when, also, you know the free fall, the footage we've just seen, before the, before the doors were opened for the, to Joe public, the Beatles and all the Apple office workers 
when it was first. So they had what they wanted, and then why not? You know, and then, and then it was, the rest was left you know, to, the, to the public. So that was one that bye bye I didn't get. But there is a happy ending. You got it. Earlier on this year, like. I, I, um, some of you guys might know, I, I run a, a page on Facebook, Psychedelic Clothing for Men. It's been, it's been amazing because through that, the, through that page, I have got to meet or got, got in contact with some amazing people from the 60s. Pop musicians, to people that ran boutiques, designers. And uh, I got uh, told about I, the, the, my contact in America for Granite Taste Trip. He got word that there was a, an Apple boutique thing. We all kind of help each other out because this particular guy's into 70s stuff, shops like Alcazura, and so if I hear about stuff like that, I tell him, and you know we all kind of help each other. So he says, Pete, there's this guy that's supposedly selling a, a granite taste drip jacket. I mean, an Apple boutique jacket. So I was given a contact, so I kind of contacted this guy, and it's when you don't know someone, you know, it can be a bit shady. So the, the deal was kind of struck, so I had to go down to London, literally, I had to meet this guy with my money in a brown envelope. <laughs> Quite, this is, this is what I kid you not, I had, to, I had to take the day off work, I work in a private store. So went went down with this money in my brown envelope, I had to meet this guy, he turned up on a motorbike, the, the, the garment I'm just about to show you was just in a, in a, like a Tesco's plastic bag. <laughs> so, so he goes, here's the garment, so here's the money. So I said to him, well, and, and, and I'm, I'm old school, it, I do just need money. So there was quite a lot of money in, in this brown envelope. So I said, look, you better count the money. So you can imagine the scene, you know, like midday, St Pancras, the dodgy looking guy with my hair cut, giving this guy, he's counting out this money, he hands me this bloody, hands me this plastic bag, you know, and we walk away. I was waiting for that kind of tap on the shoulder. <laughs> so anyway, like uh, talking about this, it's honestly, it's magical. I had this garment in my bag, you know, I'd had a, I'd a, I'd a quick look at it, but you know that was it, and I was I was happy. So I get on the train, and literally this this transaction was done within an hour. And to get in like a train from like say Derby to London, it's over 100 quid for. So I'm on this train and I'm sat down, and my heart's pumping, and I um, pulled out this absolute. Wow. It's like, I, I, I can honestly say I cried when I pulled it out because it's oh, like... Oh, so, I'm not so, um, it, 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 it's literally never been worn. Oh. Well, there's, uh, Will it ever there, was, there was two of them made and there's a picture of the, a model wearing one. Oh well, that's one I, I, I actually, through Facebook, Margie, one of the Ford, I, I'm in contact with her. So she, when the, when, there's been a few things I've asked her about in the past about the Ford and she's kind of... So when I sent her the picture, I got this. She was like really happy for me, you know. The, so yeah, it's a, it's a, a tapestry print. Yeah, beautiful, absolutely. Yeah, like uh, the, the detailing, it, like the bottom. Visual it's board. just shiny. Wow. Okay, like proper brocade. It's. Uh, Don't think you're getting this one, Flash. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's going to be a few years. It, 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 it will break eventually. It will from certain teeth. Yeah, 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 I have worn it. Yeah. Is it going to be nice? Put it on. Put it on. Put it on. Put it on. Yes! Woo! Yes, yes. Oh, look at that! Laura! Oh! 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 Wow. 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 
Don't take it off. No, it's really yeah. heavy. It's it, it, it so oh, heavy, sure. really. Yeah. Like, kinda, you could wear this in the Antarctic with nothing else on you before. So the air. The line is like when when that when they were doing the uh, one of the reasons why they went lost, even the labels were so expensive to make. Just yeah. Like, yeah. You know, even like I've seen just labels alone on eBay going for silly silly money. So just to, like uh, just to give you an idea, I've had a, a rough valuation on this, and it's between five and ten thousand pounds. Like some of the grand sets of trips do the prices. This this most probably if it went to the right auction house would be five figure. So how much do you pay? I reckon the five I'm not saying. It was a four figure. Twenty now. It was four figure. So we're near the end now. We're we'll turn off the lights again. We're uh, we're at we're now at the, the last garment, and last but definitely not least, and probably most my most treasured piece for a lot of reasons. So before we talk about it. I'm going to see some lovely footage of the man and his caftan. This is from the last gig they did at Hoxton Hall last November. Before I proceed, I just want to say. I am so privileged and honoured to know so many talented people and we've got a guy in here that was actually on stage with the uh, stand up for <laughs> The Indian cotton kaftan was purchased at Granite Tree in the spring of 1967. It was then worn at a photo session at Adam and Eve News in the spring of the same year. One of these photos would grace the cover of the psychedelic masterpiece, Tangerine Dream. So there's the uh, kaftan. The kaftans were sold like hotcakes and were worn from everybody from David Crosby to Jimi Hendrix. So everyone, all, all, everyone was wearing them. <laughs> they were, uh, they were, they, they sold these so quickly. The, the the cotton came over from India, and allegedly it was, it was tailored by Jewish tailors, and they were just making them so quickly they didn't even put a label in them. But they were they were sold in two two shops. They were, sold, they were sold in Granite Street and hung on you. So there's Bobby Elliott. And it's did hard to say whether the hat's matching. Pete, Pete, did, that, did any real people get hold of those things at the time? I did, like, the, the thing is, the misconception is, you know like when you think the 60s and all this kind of clothing, there was most probably about 100 people. No one could afford it. Yeah. You know, you bought, the only people that wore this clothing were these pop stars or the rich kids that owned the hoodies or and, and had rich parents. So not a pop from Stoke then. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Same thing. Oh, well, 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 well. well. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's that's Nixon. That's that, 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 that could be a nice story. <laughs> <laughs> poor, the poor. The next yeah, 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 yeah. 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 did, did, did good. Yeah. 2020, I think that's the one So then... So... Yeah. So... Yeah. So... Yeah. So... Yeah. So... Yeah. So... Yeah. So... 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 The story of how I managed to acquire Peter Daltrey's kaftan goes back quite a few years. Like I said earlier on, I've, I've got this Facebook page 
And about six or seven years ago, um, Peter messaged me and says, you know, would you mind if I put some pictures up on your page? And I was like, you know, would I mind? <laughs> so, you know, so, so through yes. that, you know, we kind of, we, you know, we were kind of like friends in the, you know, the nether world of Facebook, you know, beyond, well, the real world. <laughs> and uh, then Kaleidoscope got, to got back together around about 2010, 2011. We went over to see you in Gihon. I can't recall now what year it was. Someone might. Name today? No, 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 it was, it was, no, it was, it was 2012. Was, was it? Was it? Yeah. So, um, so, so they did some gigs and then, then it all went quiet. And then, then, they got, then they got back together and did some European dates this year, last year, and then finished. So, um, I was told on, on the grapevine again that Peter was getting rid of all his stuff. And it's kind of one of those things where, you know, these clothes are spiritual, you know, he's had these things for so long that I want it kind of thing. So it's like, how do I breach this? How do I say it in a polite way that... Give me your clothes. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah basically. It is a bag of money. What, what if I thought I went to I contacted I, um, through contacts with Peter. You know, he says, you know, are you serious about wanting that? I says, yeah. So we agree, we agreed a price, and it was a it was a lot of money. But honest to God, he could have sold it for ten times what I paid for it. It was a four figure sum, but he could have it could have been so much more. But it was kind of really, you know, he said that he wanted it to go to someone he knew would yeah. go and take it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, it's spiritual home. And I, and I, I genuinely, I'm not just saying this, but it's like um, when I got it, you know, there was a nice letter and everything. And we were in London on the weekend and we were sending each other texts back, back and forth. This is it, it'll be, on the, it'll be in the post for you and it'll, it was the end of November. So um, I, said, I said to him at any time, and I truly mean this, that if ever he wanted it back, he could have it back, but for him, for like, you know what I mean? I'm not <laughs> So I suppose, you know, like, let's take you out of the next session. I've worn it, I've worn it a couple of times, but it's, like it's, it's in great condition. You've actually tried it on, haven't you, sir? I couldn't get my hands to it. <laughs> <laughs> so it, it, it's kind of like, um, it's very, really delicate. Yeah, but, so for that reason, like, I've worn it, like, I've, like when I got it, literally the day I got it, I set up our room. You know, even before Susie got home, set it off, you know, like, like me, but Susie gets home from work, right, get the camera out, you know. <laughs> that's, that's literally the truth, so I thought, I'm going to get some pictures wearing it, that, I'm, that I can wear it, and then, you know, you know, maybe ten years down the line, you know, if I put on weight or something, you know, I can say, shit, I'm going to all that all the time. So, so that's the, uh, it's here. Uh, uh, so that, that, we're so, so, so we're we're now at the end of this. Before I, before I say you know thank you, I just want to say a couple of thank yous. Firstly to Susie, like when we were putting this show together, honestly Susie was fifty percent of you know like the ideas with the slides because the, there was a lot involved, and you know, there was a lot like when I was doing my writing when I'd read it to Susie, there'd be so many people. The grammar's not right there, or this ain't right. In the bin. No, it's right. Tantrum, go away and start writing it down. But it was really. It was all right, I get it all the time. So, despite her involvement. Also, while I'm on the thanks, I just want to I want to just say thanks to Kath and Craig that have helped me and Sue as we've put this together. Yeah. Like that, yeah. it's like you know, like the artist and the, the, the money side of it. I'm the, 
I'm not saying I'm an artist, but when it comes to the business sides of anything, organisation, useless. Kath and Craig come in, make it into a professional streamlined kind of. Yeah. And last but not least, <laughs> thanking you all for coming tonight. And hopefully, we're going to do some. It's going to be a bit different to any clubs I'd like to think you've been to before. Don't expect to.